Grandy. Okay, thanks, Mike, and thanks to the, the Utah Community Forest Council, Utah State University Extension for organizing this uh, this webcast today. Uh, my intention is to provide some basic tree biology as a foundation to describe different types of pruning, so that when the webcast is done, you'd be able to explain to others fundamental biological principles like how trees compartmentalize disease and how branches are attached to their parent stems so that later on you could articulate how basic pruning cuts are made and then help people understand the different classifications of pruning or why we would do them and under what circumstances. It seems to me that the profession of arboriculture has a bit of a image problem insofar as a lot of people still don't think that it requires any special knowledge or skill to work on trees. With the bad economy that we have now, we're seeing more and more damaging tree work as people who are maybe otherwise unemployed but not afraid to work hard, not afraid of heights, not afraid to work with chainsaws, go out and promote themselves as tree workers. The problem is that working on trees does take quite a bit of knowledge and skill and it requires an understanding of science and tree biology. So we'll begin with tree biology and then move to explaining how that can be applied to pruning trees. When we think about trees, an important concept to understand is that trees are long-lived organisms. They may live for decades or centuries and even more. I think of the bristlecone pines in the mountains in Utah or the giant sequoias that can live for thousands of years. While they live for decades or centuries and even more, they can't move. So they can't seek shelter when the 100-year storm visits, when high wind, freezing rain, or heavy snow impose burdens on the structure of trees. So trees have to be adapted to be able to withstand the forces of nature in one spot throughout their long lives of decades or centuries. We also need to understand that trees have a limited amount of energy available for their use. They have energy that's needed for their own metabolism, for storage for, for uh, future use, for uh, disease resistance, for, um, for, for reproduction, and also for growth. Now, the axiom of uniform stress tells us that trees don't waste a lot of energy making too much tissue. They don't do that because it would be taking energy away from the other things that are very, very important, like disease resistance and reproduction. But they do deploy sufficient energy to make whatever structures they need to withstand the forces of nature throughout their long life of decades or centuries. One of those adaptations is in stems. Stems are tapered from their tips, where they're just a little bud on a twig, all the way down to their base, where they're widest. This tapered structure provides flexibility and strength that distributes the dynamic loads of, say, high winds throughout the length of the stem itself. So when the wind blows a limb, it absorbs energy by flexing and then dissipates that energy by flexing back. A second adaptation is that stems are distributed more or less evenly throughout the crown. Major limbs are distributed more or less evenly throughout the trunk. Uh, smaller branches are distributed more or less evenly along major limbs and so forth. That distributes the weight of the tree itself and the forces of nature throughout the crown of the tree. Those of us who work with trees know that as trees grow in diameter they get heavier and heavier every year, putting increasing force on their point of attachment. Moreover, they're getting longer and longer every year providing increasing or, or creating increasing leverage and force on the point of attachment. That leverage is compounded by high winds or the loads of freezing rain or heavy snow. So the tree deals with those loads that get worse, get, get heavier and, and more pronounced as the years go by by distributing them more or less evenly throughout the crown of the tree. So taper is an adaptation to dissipate the force of wind and other dynamic forces of nature. Another very important adaptation are branch sway mechanisms that have been described recently by Dr. Ken James, who's a research engineer in Australia. 
in a uh, phenomenon he describes as mass damping. And what mass damping is, is a coordination between the limbs. Limbs do not sway in the wind synchronously at the same time. If they did, the tree would roll over and break. Watch a tree that's being buffeted by wind sometime and notice how the branches are, are, are bending and then releasing at different times. And by it re bending and releasing at different times, the tree isn't taking the full force of the wind throughout its entire structure simultaneously. And what Dr. James found is that this is, occurs even in very small twigs. Small twigs attached to larger branches that, that are asynchronous with the smaller ones. And they are asynchronous with the branches they are attached to, which are asynchronous with, with the ones that they are attached to, and so forth on into the trunk of the tree. And what we find is, is that every branch attachment or every limb acts as a shock absorber. If you look to the lower left of the picture of the Baroque that I have here, you'll see a little diagram with little shock absorbers that represents the juncture between limbs that, that Dr. James is describing in terms of mass damping. Another important adaptation that trees have for, aer for an adaptation to dissipate the force of wind are leaf aerodynamics. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a single slide I have later. And then the root soil system interaction. If you look at the, the little drawing, the schematic drawing of a trunk and limbs on the far lower left corner, you see the root flare or the, the, the flare, the root collar of the trunk of the tree going into the roots of the tree, which are just beneath the surface of the soil. That combination of flare and the fanning out of roots near the surface of the soil also helps dissipate the forces of nature, the high winds and the dynamic loads that make their way down to the base of the tree. Stems have other functions as well. They support the tree. They store carbohydrates. They are responsible for transporting carbohydrates and, and growth regulators. And they conduct water and minerals. The wood of the tree is made up of xylem. And xylem, among other things, are comprised of, of vascular cells, hollow conducting cells, tracheids in gymnosperms, and vascular elements in angiosperms. You might think of them as hollow conducting cells that are stacked one on top of another. Notice also that they are perforated. They are perforated among other things to allow the radial movement of water inside the wood. Now while this hollow conducting structure is necessary for the survival of tree to conduct water and, and mineral elements along the length of the stem, they also leave the tree vulnerable to the spread of diseases along their length. Now trees have mechanisms to try to slow the spread of disease. After a tree is wounded and diseases entering a tree, the tree may respond by trying to plug these vascular elements. They often have companion cells called the parenchyma cells. And in some species, these parenchyma cells in response to wounding will inject their membranes into the tracheids and vascular elements. In other cases, there are antimicrobial compounds that are injected into the vessels in, in vascular elements, and in some cases, both. The idea is to try to slow or impede, and if possible, stop the spread of disease along the length of stems. But it turns out that this mechanism is relatively weak, and trees are poorly adapted at controlling the spread of disease along their length. Now, the way trees control disease was described by the late Dr. Alex Shigo uh, in an abbreviation he called CODIT, compartmentalization of decay in trees. Compartmentalization of decay in trees, or CODIT, has two parts consisting of four walls. The first part has three walls, and that occurs in the wood that exists at the time the tree was injured. And the part four is a barrier zone put down by the cambium, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. We'll focus now on wall, uh, wall one. This is part one, wall one, which I just described, uh, where the tree tries to slow or impede the spread of disease along the length of the stem by plugging or injecting antimicrobial compounds into the vascular elements or tracheids. In this case, if you look at the bottom of the bolt, a uh, picture of the tree on the right, you'll see ones with little arrows showing um, some a discolored area 
at, at the base of a larger discolored area, uh, showing that the tree has antimicrobial compounds and is working to slow or impede the downward spread of disease. So this is wall one. It's also the weakest wall in the CODIT model. Wall two uh, is a mechanism to try to slow or impede the inward spread of disease. If you look on the bolt on, on the left side, just above the one, you'll see a two with an arrow. That two with an arrow is showing the extent of wall two. So wall two runs more or less concentrically with the annual rings. And here again, in response to wounding, the tree lays down antimicrobial compounds in an effort to slow or impede, in this case, the inward spread of disease into the tree. If you look above that, and to the right, you'll see a little three. There's a little uh, uh, radial, almost a straight line, where you see wall three. Wall three is associated with the vascular rays. Vascular rays come out from the pith and, and radiate out like spokes on a bicycle tire in the wood of a tree. Among other things, their job is to allow the inward and outward flow of, of minerals and, and carbohydrates. In response to wounding, wall three will be impregnated with antimicrobial compounds. And the job of wall three is to protect the radial spread of disease inside the tree. Wall three is stronger than wall two. And wall two is stronger than wall one. So in the CODIT model, the quote walls are numbered in sequence in order of their strength, wall one being the weakest, three being the strongest in this case. Here is an interior view of a tree that was injured when two branches grew into one another and damaged themselves by grinding uh, due to the uh, forces of, of high winds or freezing rain. I have marked wall two, and you can see a discolored area that has breached wall two all the way to the center of the tree. The discolored area indicates that there are pioneering microorganisms that work their way all the way to the center of the tree. So wall two has given away all the way into the, to the pith. Notice at about 3 o'clock, we see some um, more advanced decay uh, fingering their way into the wedge-shaped area of, of, of light discoloration. This advanced decay are wood rotting organisms that are taking advantage of the change in structure that have been created by the pioneering microorganisms that were first to advance. Now notice also that this discoloration, as I'd mentioned, is in a pie shape. It's in a pie shape because wall three is holding very well. Look at the lower arrow on wall three, and you can see a very dark line, or not a very dark line, but you'll see a, a dark line indicating that there are uh, antimicrobial compounds inside that vascular ray. A vascular ray holding the, the, the decay into a pie shape in the center of the tree. Now, there are times that compartmentalization is very, very strong. The tree is strong and the diseases are weak. In these cases, disease can be compartmentalized to an inconsequential degree inside the tree. On the other hand, there are times when diseases are strong and the tree is weak. And in these cases, complete hollow might develop in the core of the tree, in the wood of the tree. In other words, all the wood being decayed and lost to, to wood rotting organisms. So this is where part two comes in. Part two is laid down by the vascular cambium in response to wounding. The vascular cambium is an area at the interface between the wood and the bark it's responsible for making wood to the inside. Once the tree makes wood the first time, it can't replace it. So if wood rotting organisms are destroying the wood on the inside, the tree cannot replace that wood that's being lost. So in response to wounding, the vascular cambium will lay down a very strong chemical barrier called the barrier zone. The barrier zone's job is to contain disease inside the diameter of wood that existed at the time the tree was injured. And here's what it might look like on the inside of a tree. This tree had received a, a heading cut, which is a serious wound about five years before this picture was taken. The discolorated area in there indicates the diameter of the stem at the time that it was injured. If you look at the interface between the discolored wood and the sound wood to the outside, you'll see a very, star a very dark line. 
that is where the vascular cambium formed a barrier zone. Notice that the wood outside the barrier zone is very clean of disease. So the barrier zone is very strong chemically and will protect new wood being laid down after the tree was injured. And what we have here then is a sort of race. A race between the vascular cambium laying down new wood and the microorganisms, the disease causing organisms, destroying the old. And the structural integrity of the tree is at stake. Engineers will tell us that if a tree can maintain at least a third of its diameter in sound wood, a third of its radius or diameter in sound wood, it will be structurally sound. Less than a third, and it could fail. So if there is a tree that's wounded and the wound go, and decay goes all the way to the outside of a tree, that's a weak place and may indicate that the tree could fail. Now while the barrier zone is very strong chemically, it can be weak structurally. Here is the inside of a tree that received a very serious wound, perhaps due to a car strike many years before. You can see an, an area of discoloration there and, and a little smile, a crack, indicating where the barrier zone used to be. Now we can see that hollow has developed, the walls two and three have been breached all the way throughout the core of the tree. Wood rotting organisms are followed behind the pioneering microorganisms creating a hollow. Notice at the top of the wound that the tree has developed a ram's horn as, as it calloused and closed and cracked and, uh, and pushed against itself and formed a crack. A crack that has allowed diseases to escape their containment in the barrier zone. Moreover, the wood, the sound wood, has been pulled away from the bad wood along the barrier zone. That is called a ring shake, and it's also a structural flaw that can allow diseases to escape their containment. So in this case, we can see that diseases have escaped the containment of the barrier zone and are now working outside in the wood that the barrier zone had originally tried to protect. So the advantage in the race for the structural integrity of the tree in this case is with the diseases. And this tree, in fact, higher up had formed a hollow and it was removed as a hazard tree. Trees also have leaves. Leaves are important because they are a food source for the tree. They are the only food source for the tree and the tree can't eat otherwise. Uh, Dr. Shigo used to remind us that fertilizing trees is not feeding them. It's more analogous perhaps to vitamins in the human model. You could eat all the vitamins you wanted and if you weren't eating food you would starve to death. And the same is true for trees. So leaves photosynthesize using carbon dioxide and water and the energy of light to make carbohydrates. I talked about the aerodynamic qualities of leaves as well. Here's some interesting pictures. Um, done with some research that was published in the Journal of Arboriculture way back in 1996 six by Stephen Wright. And it shows the leaf of a tulip poplar. The leaf on top uh, is being subject to very light winds and increasing winds all the way to the bottom where you can see that the leaf is folded into a cone. Uh, other tree species have dynamic qualities as well. For example, a pine tree, the pine needles will, will flatten out in a fascicle of pine needles will flatten out in high winds. Uh, some trees turn sideways like a quaking aspen. They act more like, more or less like a weather vane. So tree leaves try to reduce the forces of nature through aerodynamic qualities like this. Trees also have apical meristems. Apical meristems are important because they make leaves and they're also responsible for the lengthwise growth of trees. They also do other things though. Apical meristems are the source of manufacture of some chemicals that help regulate the growth of trees. Now there are many such chemicals and scientists call them growth regulators. But a class of growth regulators that are manufactured in the apical meristems are called auxins. Auxins can do a lot of things. One of the things that auxins do is they suppress shoots below them so that the terminal shoot is longer than secondary shoots. Secondary shoots are longer than tertiary shoots and some buds are dormant altogether. And that is how the tree maintains an even distribution of branches and stems throughout its crown. 
Now it turns out that apical meristems also stimulate root growth. And there is a uh, class of growth regulators that are manufactured in root tips and other places. But a, a class of growth regulators manufactured in shoot tips called cytokinins. So cytokinins stimulate, it turns out, shoot growth. So as uh, the roots grow in the spring of the year, as the soil warms, the root tips make cytokinins and send them up to the top of the tree. And the top of the tree begins to grow and manufactures auxins and sends them out to the bottom. And of course, this is all oversimplified. But to give you an idea how the tree system communicates with one another, they do so through these growth regulators. So as the auxins are manufactured, they're sent down to the roots, and that stimulates root growth. As the roots grow, they manufacture cytokinins, which are sent up to the top. So that in 50 years, a 50-year-old tree will have 50 years' worth of shoots and buds and, and limbs and trunk and roots. Now roots are interesting because they're on the surface of the soil. We talked about the, the interface between the, the, the root collar, the flare at the base of the trunk, and, and the, the dynamics of being able to distribute the forces of nature in the soil as the roots fan out. This is an interesting picture of some folks that took the time to dig up an apple tree out of an orchard and show where the limbs might be. So it turns out, not the limbs, but the roots. It turns out that the roots of trees are very near the surface of the soil. If we think about it, that makes sense because that is where rain is first going to fall. That is where the leaves fall and provide organic matter on the surface. They decompose and provide uh, essential elements for the tree itself. And so, and also that's where oxygen is. If we get much below two or three feet in most soils, roots simply can't survive. So the function of roots is anchorage, storage, uh, to absorb water and elements, to conduct them, uh, up, up, uh, be, uh, to allow conduction by the leaves up from the, the, the soil through the roots into the top of the tree, and as I'd mentioned, growth re regulator production as well. Now it turns out that apical meristems and the auxins that they manufacture are also responsible for cambial growth. So in the spring of the year, as auxins are manufactured in the, the shoot tips, the auxins work their way down the stem and stimulate the vascular cambium to grow in diameter. So diameter growth begins at the tip of a stem and works its way down to the parent stem. And that is how the tree manufactures and maintains its taper, the taper that's responsible for absorbing high winds and freezing rain and the forces of nature throughout the tree's long life of decades or centuries. It's also important to understand that cambial growth begins at shoot tips if we understand, want to understand how branches are attached to their parent stem. So in the spring of the year, the smaller diameter branches, the twigs, will begin to grow first. Cambial growth will work its way down those branches and hit its parent stem. And it turns out later on, the larger diameter branches will begin to grow from their tip and work their way down and envelop that wood that's already been laid down by the smaller branch. So branches are attached with two layers of wood. They are laminated in place with two layers of wood every year. And that is how a branch attachment gets stronger and stronger every year as the limb increases in diameter and as how it increases in length and puts in uh, greater and greater stress on its point of attachment. Here's a very ingenious study done by, by an undergraduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point probably about 10 maybe 15 years ago now. And what he did is he took uh, some PVC pipe and uh, attached it to a vacuum cleaner and drew green food coloring down a branch and red food coloring down a parent stem. This is a red maple sample taken in the springtime and you can see up against the parent stem there's a lot of green food coloring indicating that that wood from the 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 branch itself has worked its way down the stem down the down its length and pressed up against the parent stem. Here is a sample taken later on in the year during the summertime and you can see at the base of the branch there is red food coloring indicating that wood from the branch itself has enveloped the base of, of uh, the uh, wood from the parent stem rather has enveloped the base of, of the branch. So at the base of every branch are two layers of wood. 
two layers of wood that can form a swelling called a branch collar. Uh, this is a branch collar on a Norway maple and you can see a pretty clear interface between where the, the trunk be, uh, begins and where the branch ends. We can even see in this case that the, the branch has smooth bark, smooth, smooth juvenile bark, and the trunk has uh, more, more rough mature bark. Trees also have one other defense mechanism. Branches originate from a bud on a twig. And so all the way back, the core of the branch works its way all the way back from the base of its branch to the pith. Now it turns out that in response to a wound in the branch, antimicrobial compounds will form in that branch core, forming what Dr. Scheigel called a branch protection zone. And its job is to keep disease that may be in the branch from entering the tree and spreading throughout the tree. Branch protection zones tend to be very strong. However, diseases can use energy stored in the branch itself to overcome the branch protection zone over time. Another important structure in trees is a branch bark ridge. And at the base of branches, we have an area of raised bark. It's just caused by bark on, on the branch and bark on the parent stem colliding with one another and, and forming a little a raised area. Trees have other stems besides just branches, twigs, limbs, and a trunk. They have codominant stems. A codominant stem is defined as any branch that's 50% or more of the diameter of its parent stem. Codominant stems have no branch protection zones. They can also create structural failures as they often grow into one another and grow together and pry one another apart. Look at the base of these two uh, 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 codominant stems and you'll see a crease. That crease indicates that at that place these two codominant stems had been separate and they have now grown together and they are wounding one another, crushing into one another as they grow increasing in diameter. This injury is compounded by the grinding motion as the trees and the stems sway due to high winds and freezing rain and the forces of nature. So codominant stems attachments pry one another apart and they get weaker and weaker every year and, and they also get invaded by diseases. Remember the, the si slide that we had with the internal picture of walls two and three and we noticed that these two stems had injured one another and that diseases had been invading that injury. Those were two codominant stems and if we cut open these two codominant stems we would undoubtedly find decay working in there. So this can be a very pronounced um, very pronounced structural flaw. Inside of codominant stems that have grown together there is bark included in the branch attachment and we call it included bark. And you can see codominant stems with included bark because of that crease that we see on each side where the stems had grown together. I had mentioned that this is a structural flaw and these stems, the codominant stems, are the ones that are most likely to fail in high wind, freezing rain, and heavy snow. After the next storm in your area, take a look at the limbs that have pulled out of trees and see whether or not you can't find an area of highly polished bark at the upper end of the point of their former attachment. So let's talk about topping a little bit. I think that it's common knowledge that topping is injurious to trees, but often we don't reflect on why. Here's a, a row of, of top trees, and recall that a tree that would be 50 years old is supposed to have 50 years worth of foliage, 50 years worth of twigs and limbs and branches and stems. The first thing that we notice about these cottonwoods is that almost all the foliage has been removed. Now remember that trees have a limited amount of resources even if they're fully, fully foliated. They have a limited amount of resources to put into disease resistance, to put into reproduction, into their metabolism, into storage, and into growth. Now we've just removed the single food source from all these trees. And what's more, we have exposed the entire cross-section of every one of those stems, leaving the tree with only wall one, its weakest line of defense, to work against the diseases that are going to be invading those stems at a time when the tree has no energy 
to fight that disease. So we are giving a pronounced advantage to the disease in the struggle for the structural integrity of the tree. What's more, when we top a tree, we've removed all the apical meristems and their accompanying auxins. We haven't touched the roots, so there's still cytokinins being made in the root tips, and they're going to come up, and they're not going to be offset by auxins. Remember, auxins suppress shoot growth. So the tree system is going to realize, in quotes, that it's in a crisis, and it has to, be, has to respond. And so many species of trees will respond by issuing a proliferation of shoots to quickly replace the foliage that had been lost to topping. Now, a lot of people top trees because they say, my tree is getting too tall. But it is a worthless occupation because the tree is going to quickly, in a matter of a year or two, get back to the height that it was before it was topped. And what's more, because there are no auxins, these branches and stems that are growing are not scattered evenly throughout the crown of the tree, but they are clustered in one spot. They're also poorly tapered. They grow so fast that they have no taper. Look at those shoots and see that they have a uniform diameter almost along their entire length. So they don't flex and absorb the forces of nature along their length, but rather they wind up bending at their point of attachment. Moreover, they're all co-dominant stems, and they're going to be growing into one another and prying one another apart. And what's more, they are attached on the outside, on the point of the tree that's rotting, rather than from a bud on a, twi uh, on a twig with a branch core that you can trace all the way back through the entire diameter of the tree. So here we can see the photo on the left from Dr. Shigo, a cluster of shoots proliferating from a point on the tree that's rotting, and they're all co-dominant stems. So how do we apply some of this knowledge to pruning? One is that we need to be aware of branch collars. If we remove a branch exactly at the branch collar, we will only expose the core of the branch and its branch protection zone. We're not going to leave a stub because we don't want to leave an energy source for diseases to use to potentially overcome the barrier zone and enter the tree. So if you remove the branch precisely at the collar of the tree and only expose the core of the branch and the branch protection zone, you give a pronounced advantage to the tree in its struggle with diseases for its structural integrity. Again, we don't want to leave a stub because if we leave a stub, we provide an energy source for diseases to use, potentially overcome the branch protection zone. This is a properly removed branch that had been improperly pruned by a heading cut uh, many years before. Diseases had worked their way down the branch, overcoming wall one all the way to the base of the branch. And you can see an area of discoloration there indi indicating that I'm sorry, Mike, you, you've got something for me? Uh, well, go ahead and finish this slide. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, uh, indicating that, that disease-causing organisms had been attempting to overcome the branch protection zone and enter the tree. Go ahead. Okay, we have a question from Hal Jensen there in the chat pod. Uh, question is, how do you feel about repairing topping cuts? Okay, I, uh, Hal, I have some slides to talk about that a little bit later on when we're talking about categorizing uh, or categories or types of pruning. And so you've anticipated something that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later on. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so here is a properly pruned uh, 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 limb, and you can see that the wound is closing equally on all sides. And what we find is that, that we do a proper pruning cut, it will close in a donut like this. And again, we can see clearly from this slide that we've only exposed the core of the branch. And we know from our tree biology that it is accompanied by the branch protection zone. Now, not all trees have read the book. And not all trees have a real evident branch collar. And in these cases, we need to approximate uh, the branch collar, and we do so by finding the branch bark ridge. If you look at the top of that cut, you see the ridge going down. And approximating the collar is done by mirroring outwardly the angle, the inward angle of the branch bark ridge. And you end the cut opposite the bottom of that branch bark ridge. Now, some trees haven't read the book, and some branch bark ridges are, are quite long. And so it doesn't always work like this. 
but more often than not it does and we make an outward angle Now, the idea of an outward angle cut has been challenged lately by uh, the Dirk Duyasefkin with some work that he's done in Germany. Now, Dr. Duyasefkin calls his system of pruning the Hamburg system of pruning, but all he did really is reiterate previous work by Dr. Alex Scheigo. Now, Dr. Duyasefkin says that in cases of approximating the cut, if we make an outward angle, oftentimes there's a dead area below the cut, and we can see that in the left picture. So he is recommending a more flush cut. Now, I have not seen his research duplicated anywhere, and I'm not recommending it right now. I'm just providing this information to you to say that it's out there, and it's something that is probably worth looking at. Uh, but I need more information before I am willing to recommend this. So this is just for informational purposes right now. And for my sake, I've called this a Hamburg cut rather than to allow Dr. Duyasefkin to name an entire system of pruning uh, uh, himself, and especially after it's already been done. The problem with a flush cut, like Dr. Duyasefkin may be uh, recommending, is that if we do it on a tree with a branch collar, we are allowing diseases to circumvent the branch protection zone and we are allowing a direct port of entry for diseases. If you look on the uh, picture on the left, we can see that a flush cut has allowed diseases to enter above and below the wound. The core of the branch looks pretty good. Uh, it's got its branch protection zone and it's, it seems to be functioning quite well, but uh, the rest of the tree is not. Notice also that the wound here has been painted. Uh, it turns out that tree paint at best does no good and at worst can actually accelerate decay. I've got some slides that talk about this a little bit later on so we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time on another slide. So here's a picture that Dr. Shigo took after wounding two, uh, uh, two bolts of, of a red oak I think about five six years before this picture was taken. Notice the bolt on the left we see the core of the branch with just a little bit of decay working inside but that decay is limited to the branch core. The branch protection zone is working and wood outside the core of the branch is sound and clear of disease. On the right we see a tree that had its branch color removed due to a flush cut. Again we see the core of the branch is sound, it's working fine, the branch protection zone is working fine rather, but above and below the wound we see uh, diseases have entered the tree itself so the branch protection zone has been circumvented. The picture on the right is also a good uh, model to allow us to compare the weakness or the relative weakness of wall one where we see disease going down and out of the picture and up and out of the picture versus the stronger wall two which is allowed disease uh, to work inwardly uh, to a limited degree. Also notice that the barrier zone has worked pretty well and that the tree has put on about as much wood outwardly as the diseases have uh, wrecked inwardly. On the other hand, if you take a peek just above the wound, you'll, you'll look at outside the branch protection zone, there's a small little bit of discoloration that is escaping containment, indicating disease have escaped their containment of the barrier zone due to a small crack in the barrier zone. So it would be interesting to follow this tree through the course of a number of years to find out how it did over the long run in its struggle for its structural integrity, its race for its structural integrity with diseases. Now not all branches uh, can be, well there are times when we don't want to remove a branch all the way at its branch collar. Uh, we want to shorten the length of a branch and we do so by a technique called a lateral cut. In the case of a lateral cut we identify the branch bark ridge and we start just outside the branch bark ridge and we make an angle cut and end opposite the bottom of the limb to which we're reducing. Now if we think about this for just a moment we have exposed the entire cross section of this stem to diseases leaving only wall one to protect the tree. So we need to be very, very careful here. And so the rules that are recommended is that we ought to be removing no more than quarter or half the foliage from this stem system. We need to be aware that each stem is autonomous in its energy requirements. So the tree requires the foliage on a stem 
to manufacture enough food to maintain that stem or the stem will die. The tree simply says we're not going to waste our energy on you and we're not going to provide energy from other areas of the tree to keep you alive. So we need to provide enough energy or leave enough leaves on that stem system to provide energy for that stem to be able to maintain its structural integrity, to maintain its role as a lead, to close the wound and to fight off disease that's going to be entering it. If we don't do that, this cut is no better than a topping cut. Now if we do it properly and with the right species, some species of trees, and this is a Pacific Madrone, can maintain disease to a very limited degree and the, the limb system will close and it will be perfectly healthy. In other cases, again, it is no better than a topping cut, so we need to be very, very careful here. Subordination is also an important technique and it may employ a, a crown reduction cut uh, like I've just described or a lateral cut and it may employ thinning cuts. It takes advantage of the idea that limbs are autonomous in their energy requirements and so if you want to remove a limb or say turn a codominant stem into a regular stem you might be able to slow its growth down by thinning out the branches and the foliage on that stem itself. It will slow its growth down allowing other parts of the tree to grow larger. So you can take a codominant stem and change it into a stem or you can gradually remove that stem over time through the technique of subordination. Now there are some important standards and specifications for pruning. One is the American National Standard uh, for Arboricultural Operations, for tree care operations, ANSI A300. It's the document on the left. It provides sort of a what to do when we're talking about trees. The International Society of Arboriculture has companion documents, best management practices uh, for a number of things including pruning and, and these best management practices are intended to provide how to do. So ANSI A300 says this is what to do. In other words, these are specifications that you can put in contracts or, or a description of what needs to be done and the best management practices provide more of a description of how to do it. Now when we're talking about pruning we need to go back and remember the axiom of uniform stress because one of the things that we want to do is no harm to the tree. Remember that the tree isn't going to waste energy making unnecessary parts. So if we're going to set about removing parts of the tree we better have a pretty good reason to do it because we're assuming that what we're going to be doing is going to improve upon what nature has already done. Certainly topping doesn't meet, meet, that, meet, meet that criteria. So trees should be pruned with the idea that they're going to be something else in the future, at least young and moderate trees should be. So we need forethought and we need foresights. We need to do it according to the ANSI A300 standard and the best management practices of the International Society of Arboriculture with proper tools at the proper time. So pruning should have some objectives. ANSI A300 and the best management practices from the ISA tell us that the objectives of pruning could be to reduce the risk of failure, to provide clearance over things that, in which the tree is interfering, with which the tree is interfering, to reduce shade and wind resistance, uh, to maintain tree health, to influence flower or fruit production, to improve a view or to promote aesthetics. Now there's a lot of discussion about when to prune a tree. And, and the research says that the best time to prune a tree is late in the dormant season, before the tree is going to bud out. I would also say though that the best time to prune a tree is when you know what you're doing and your pruning shears and your pruning saw is sharp. I think that we would do trees a disservice that if, if we limited the time that we pruned a tree, prune them to just late in the dormant season. Because we need to provide skilled professional people people that work on trees all the time a livelihood. If we can't provide them a livelihood nobody is going to do that work. So it seems to me that trees are better served by hiring professional people to do the work and if you know what you're doing it won't matter what time of year you prune the tree you won't harm it. I mean I'm sorry if you don't know what you're doing it doesn't matter what time of, of year you're pruning the tree you will harm it and if you know what you're doing you won't. 
That said, if your management unit is a single tree in your yard, the best time to prune it is in the late dormant season. And the flowering trees are best pruned after blossom. For example, if you were pruning a lilac, which is it was a woody plant, in the middle of winter you're removing flower buds that have been set the previous fall, and you're reducing the amount of, of, of floral display that it would have. So wait till after it's flowered and then prune the tree, and it will set buds again in the spring. So for proper branch removal, there's a technique called the three-cut technique. For stems over an inch in diameter, you go out uh, six inches or a foot, maybe maybe farther for larger branches, and you make an undercut. Yeah, look at the top of the the top picture of the three uh, on the left. Make an undercut about a third of the way up, and then uh, half an inch to two inches out from that cut, you come down from the top, and the branch will pop off. It's also called a jump cut, and then you can make your final cut at the collar. And in the bottom picture, we can see where the uh, branch has jumped off. And we can also see at the base of the branch a very pronounced line where the branch collar exists. And that would be where we make our final pruning cut. I talked about wound dressings. Uh, wound dressings don't uh, reduce decay, and they don't speed wound closure. If we think about that for a moment, if we're going to be painting our house, we don't take a hose and make it nice and wet before we apply our paint. Because if we did, the paint wouldn't adhere to the surface that we're painting, and little cracks and fissures would develop. Well, the wounding cut, the, 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 the cut that we've made, the wound that we've made, is wet. Now we're going to apply asphalt paint, and little cracks and fissures will develop. Cracks and fissures, which are the Grand Canyon to a fungal spore. And what's more, because the wound is now covered with paint, we have created environment behind that that's moist and optimal for fungal growth. So if anything, we have created an environment behind the paint that could potentially increase decay. Now there are some exceptions. Uh, if somebody wants a tree painted for cosmetics, you might be able to do it. And there are also some diseases like oak wilt or Dutch elm disease that are spread during the summer by insect vectors. And research has shown that if we have to prune those trees, trees that are susceptible to oak wilt or, or, or Dutch elm disease, during the time when the, the beetles are out, we can reduce the likelihood of the spread of disease by painting the wounds. I, I would say that should be limited to repairing storm damage and, broke, and broken limbs, however. R Randy, so training trees for Randy, structure. In we have another yes, question. Uh, uh, Angel Lopez says some USU Hort guys tell residents to use it on fruit tree cuts, so that would be wound dressing, I assume. Yeah, and and uh, I would say that uh, tr fruit trees are the same as every other tree, and uh, they have branch uh, protection zones the same as any others. And uh, so in my experience, and I'm not an orchardman, so maybe, Mike, you can correct me here, but I would think that the same principles apply to orchard trees as any others, that the branch protection zone will do the work that we want the paint to do, and so it should be Yeah, the only thing I would, and, uh, that I don't know about is whether there's maybe some disease spread uh, concerns, uh, but still, I agree with you. Um, I'll look into that further while you're talking. Maybe I'll find out more about it. Sure. And, and the only thing that I could think of is fire blight. And, and people have tried to spread fire blight by pruning a, a, a diseased tree in, with a pair of prunies and walking over to a healthy tree and pruning it again and failed. Uh, so I'm not sure what disease it could possibly be. Um, I don't want to second guess the authorities in in the horticulture department at USU. They know more about orchard work than fruit trees than I do, but I I, I just am dubious about the idea. And and perhaps I'm wrong, but I wouldn't paint a wound on a fruit tree if it was my tree. So one of the things that we can do is train trees for structure and form, and this is done on young trees or moderate trees. Uh, moderately aged trees, and when we prune a tree for structural and form, we need to think about what that tree is going to be in the future. We need to look at its structure and how branches are distributed or how we can get branches to be distributed more or less evenly throughout the crown. And if we do it right, we'll improve its stability and its longevity and decrease maintenance costs in the future. 
So when we're training for structure and form, we first of all would remove any dead or hazardous broken branches. We've improved its structure. And bear in mind that a small tree like the one that you have in here may not have branches at the height that they are right now that you ever want to keep. So a tree that's this size may not be something that you want to start uh, training for selecting branches yet. You might want it to get taller. Say if it's over a sidewalk or over a road, there may be some branches that you want to eliminate in time. But those are just ideas that you have to have when you're looking at the tree. Again, you need to prune a tree with foresight and forethought. If you thin it properly or do it right, you'll have increased uh, light and air circulation or penetration through the tree, and the tree will look better. So when we're training a small tree for structure and form, we clean the canopy by removing dead and diseased branches, and then we select one branch to become a central, uh, strong central leader. It turns out that trees with strong central leaders are stronger and more structurally sound uh, later on in life. Oftentimes when we have uh, trees with low branches, they turn into codominant stems and they will try to compete with other leaders. So if you select one tree, one limb for a strong central leader, we will need to subordinate some of those other branches to reduce their growth relative to the central leader and allow that central leader to dominate the crown of the tree. So if we train a tree properly, we'll have fewer uh, more well-spaced branches that are more or less evenly spaced throughout the crown of the tree. We're not going to have structural defects like codominant stems, and we're not going to have to worry when the tree is mature about removing large codominant stems and potentially injuring the tree. So ANSI A300 tells us that there are several different techniques for pruning. Pruning to clean, pruning to thin, pruning to rise, pruning to restore, and pruning to reduce. And incidentally, pruning to restore crown restoration is talking about trees that have been damaged by topping. And, and when we get to that slide, we will talk about um, uh, crown restoration to answer the question that was asked earlier. So the pruning techniques of pruning to clean. When we prune to clean, this is something that we would focus on mature trees mostly. In fact, a lot of mature trees, we probably don't need to do anything else. It's probably too late to correct any large defects in a mature tree. So we're just looking for stems that would be dead or diseased, uh, detached, crossing, or rubbing. So in that picture, we see a, a mess and branches that are, are rubbing with one another and potentially injuring one another. So pruning to clean is a minimal amount of pruning that we do just to try to reduce the amount of disease that might be entering the tree through rubbing branches or dead branches. Pruning to thin is a technique that would be done on uh, young trees and more uh, moderately aged trees. You can do it on older trees itself, but it's not necessary. So thin, thinning trees is crown cleaning uh, plus removing the small uh, branches uh, to reduce the crown density. A lot of times the focus for a crown thinning are the ends of branches. That's where the light is, and trees tend to wind up putting branches that are competing with, against one another for the same space. And so by thinning these out, we increase the light penetration in the interior of the tree. Interior branches can then, or limbs, can then photosynthesize and uh, carry their own weight. Because remember, the tree is not going to provide energy for those smaller branches. So they will be opening up the center of the tree. We allow those branches to grow. And then they can contribute to uh, the health and the vitality of the tree. Now look at the picture that I have. And you can see that there are a number of different small branches that are coming out competing for the same space, the same light. So in this picture, I made three cuts. You can see uh, one at the bottom uh, left on that uh, in the foreground, uh, one of the upper branches closest to you about in the middle, and a lower one over on the right. Now, if you couldn't see those little pruning cuts, it would be hard, I think, to tell that anything had been done on that branch at all. So branches are still distributed more or less evenly throughout the crown. And all that's been done is that branches that were competing for the same space that might even rub in time have been removed. Uh, notice the thin branch compared to the branches in the background now uh, where they are, are much more dense. So here's an apricot tree that I had in a former backyard in a, in a, in a former life and probably about 15 years ago. If you I, I draw your attention to the major limb, limb on the right in particular, and I spent a couple hours in that tree, 
and wound up taking quite a bit out. I would suspect that if you looked at this picture first, you would say that nothing has been done. And in fact, the best compliment that you could give somebody that is sending a tree is to tell that person that it looks like you didn't do anything. It, it doesn't look like you did anything because branches are still distributed more or less evenly throughout the crown of the tree and you've kept the axiom of uniform stress in mind and just tried to remove branches or limbs that are competing against one another. Now one problem that we have, and a lot of people are thinning trees, is that they strip all the branches in the interior of the tree. And this is called lion's tailing. Now remember how important mass damping is and the principle of mass damping. So it turns out that by removing all the interior twigs, the tree no longer benefits from damp uh, dampening the forces of high wind and freezing rain and so forth. And so lion's tail trees are more subject to breakage than limbs that have branches that are distributed more or less evenly throughout the crown of the tree. This is the last mistake that a lot of people make before they finally get it and understand pruning. A pruning to raise is a technique that's done over sidewalks and roads and all it involves is removing lower branches to allow clearance. Pruning to restore is just repairing topping cuts and, and this I think is Hal's uh, question. What you do when you're trying to prune to restore is you identify branches to, for removal and you thin them out. You try to reduce the number of branches that are coming out of that cluster to maybe two or perhaps three and you do it over time. You subordinate the other ones, you thin it out and you repeatedly do it. I have seen this technique done successfully at the Bartlett Lab uh, in North Carolina where they intentionally topped some trees, allowed them to sprout out like this and then did crown restoration over time and then actually destroyed them and cut them open to see what had happened. And it turned out that in some cases the taper had reformed on the branches and a solid branch attachment had developed if there were only one or two or possibly three branches coming out of the old heading cut. So in some cases if the tree has not been topped repeatedly and is not uh, subject to extensive rot, uh, crown restoration can be conducted safely on a tree but it takes an enormous amount of work and once you do it you also have to realize that you've admitted, admitted that the tree is damaged and if a limb does happen to fail while you're doing crown restoration on it and God forbid injure, maim or kill someone you would likely be liable for damages. And the final uh, pruning technique is, is pruning to reduce. This is done uh, often by utilities but it can also be done say if a, brand, uh, a tree is growing into an overhead space uh, like a roof where, where it needs to be kept down artificially. So there are pruning standards for the utility industry just like there are pruning standards for the greater arboriculture uh, industry. The one on the left is utility pruning of trees. Uh, the one on the right is for integrated vegetation management and we are not going to focus on that right now because this is a pruning talk. But just to, to draw your attention that utilities do have best management practices and a responsible utility should be doing work in accordance with these best management practices. So the ANSI A300 best, and, and the ISA best management practices tell us that if a branch is growing toward a conductor, we need to remove that branch at the first available natural target. A natural target being the branch collar or at a lateral of sufficient size that would allow the tree to maintain its health and maintain a leadership role in, in the crown of the tree and to, to close the wound and to protect the tree from disease that's going to enter the wound. So in this case you see a, a wire there that happens to be a telecom wire with a branch growing up toward conductors. The first available natural target looks to be you know a couple feet above a, a, a Y of just above the trunk where we see a, a limb that could be a third of the diameter of the branch we're removing. But if we did that we'd be removing more than a quarter or the half of the foliage so we're doing no better than making a topping cut. In this case the best thing to do is to remove the branch entirely exposing just the core of the branch and its associated branch protection zone. The idea of this technique is to try to train the tree around the conductors. Here are pictures, two pictures of the same tree. The one on the left I took in 1992 and Mike I think that you were on this outing. Uh, for some reason this tree had been properly pruned and directionally pruned. This is before work and on the right you see 15 years later. 
And what we have is a healthy tree that has come and overtopped uh, the wires. We do have a cleared utility space. But because the branches are overtopping the wires, they are shading the interior of the tree. Shade is important because sunlight breaks down auxins. And remember that auxins suppress shoots. So if we're shading the interior of the tree, we are leveraging the natural auxins that the tree makes, and we're going to get less growth back toward the conductors. So we have a healthy tree. We have a tree that is less likely to grow in the conductors. And we have a cleared utility space. This is why I went into utility arboriculture, because by the time I die of my fatal heart attack, what I want to do is leave behind me a healthy urban and community forest that's compatible with electricity, which is so necessary for our quality of life, for domestic life, industry, and commerce. Now, one problem with following strictly the ANSI A300 recommendation to remove branches entirely is that we are lion's tailing. This is the same picture that I showed you before and described lion's tailing. And there's no question that being a tree out like this and stripping all the branches out from the inside is lion's tailing. So one thing that I am trying to teach is that we ought to be leaving some sprouts in the interior of the tree. Now, if you look at this tree, this is after work. And what we've done is we left some smaller diameter shoots that are growing up toward the line. Now, Dr. James tells us that it doesn't take many limbs to benefit from mass damping. So anything that we leave in there will help reduce the problems associated with lion's tailing. We've left more foliage in there, so the tree is going to be more healthier. Oh, excuse me. The tree is going to be healthier. And we've allowed um, uh, the, the, the stems in there with their accompanying auxins. So we're going to get less growth back up toward the tree. So it turns out that when we do this technique, the trees hold better, they're healthier, and people find it uh, less objectionable in terms of the way the trees look. It's hard to teach because we have been saying for years, you have to remove branches entirely at the branch protection zone. Branch collars are critically important. And now I come back and say, well, you know, we can leave some sprouts in there. And if we even have to head a few of those, it's OK. The reason it's OK is that we're coming back every three years. And it's unlikely that any disease that would enter any branches that we might be heading would work its way down and enter the tree, because we can remove those larger branches next time we come through, leaving the smaller ones. So this is what I want us to do. And this is what I think all utilities ought to be doing. And it is a recommendation in the pruning best management practices of, of the International Society of Arboriculture. So for further reading. The best book on pruning that I am aware of is The Illustrated Guide to Pruning by Dr. Ed Gilman. I think that if you want to understand pruning and want to go more in depth about it, I would purchase that book. Uh, I have it, and, and I think it's an outstanding book. Uh, there's other, thing, other, other websites that I have here that are good resources for trees. One done by Mike Coons at Utah State University, treebrowser.org. Uh, treelink.org is an also a good site for, for tree information. Treesaregood.org. And I've also suggested a link to the US Forest Service Civil Cultural Manuals. Um, anybody interested in that, we, we can post that. There's no information about pruning. But anybody interested in the ecology of trees, I think, would find that to be a valuable book. And you can download that off the website or just reference particular trees by going to that website. So in summary. Trees compartmentalize disease, and at times the trees are strong and the diseases are weak. In those cases, trees can compartmentalize disease to an inconsequential degree. Other times, diseases are strong and the trees are weak, and hollows can develop. Branches are attached to parent stems with overlapping wood, so they are laminated in place and get stronger and stronger every year. Pruning cuts are made at natural targets, which would be the branch collar or a lateral of sufficient size to allow the branch to grow and be healthy. And pruning classifications are suited to specific purposes, and they need to be applied appropriately and with skill. So are there other questions? I know I've gone a little bit over, and I hope you forgive me for that. Usually I'd skip slides, but I felt pretty good about this. OK, Randy, uh, you can hear me, right? I surely can, yes. OK, uh, there's a couple of things. I looked up the fruit tree. Uh, wound dressing issue on several extension websites, including uh, Utah State Universities. And uh, I only found some old stuff that recommended wound dressings. Anything recent 
recommends against them, even for fruit trees. Um, there's a couple of questions. Hal Jensen uh, says, interesting that shade helps prevent suckering via the oxen. I guess that's not a question, more a statement. Yes. Um, Craig says, wouldn't it be cheaper to remove and then replant with a smaller variety? I guess that came with the utility pruning. You have a comment yes, on that? I, I, yes, I, I would say that's definitely true. It is, it is better uh, to remove trees often and, and start over again. It may be better for the tree, better for the community forest. Uh, there are trees, and, and I have pictures of, of, of one in my presentation, where you can train them around the lines. Um, that's not, I think, necessarily ideal because they have to go through a long, ugly duckling stage that might last for decades to get them around, and a lot of people object to the way it looks. On the other hand, there are people that just don't want their tree removed. And in those cases, uh, we don't have a lot of choice as a utility but to try to train them around the lines. And, and incidentally, directional pruning, like I described, will not work for trees like pine trees or sweet gum that have strong central leaders, Lombardi poplar. And in those cases, um, we really have no choice but to either top them or remove them. And, and, and I would argue that removing them is far better than, than removing the top of the tree. They can't be trained directionally.